Hello everyone, today we talk again about the Roman papacy, given that for a medieval history based mostly, at least channel. I think we have talked too few so far about that, so much that when I make videos people I don't know whether they even realize what we were talking about in general, and there is really a lot to tell about this topic. Again, as you know, I always pick my topics relatively randomly, right, and again it was kind of odd that we talk about papal history so few and um, we will hopefully make at some point all the videos that this topic deserves for reasons that today you wouldn't mind to say to digress on but if it weren't let's say relevant in a sense to the uh, to the topic or somewhat contained within within the same uh, indirectly in fact um, I was thinking rather at the late medieval papacy uh, that uh, albeit being kind of a not really a survivor at this point like the empire as well you know it was still uh, the two powers were universal in 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 nature and recognized uh, as such but of course and we have seen it in several videos um, a process of modernization and secularization since the 14th century had kicked in to reduce much the factual power of these institutions, even though it was still very big. And the papal one definitely was immense um, in its own, uh, uh, properly, in, in what had managed to to achieve I fr from a spiritual point of view um, in Europe during medieval times, that was indeed like kind of a pain in the behind for any kind of um, attempt of centralization from a secular uh, point of view and as you know it had brought to the same clash against the empire and behind these topics there are certain tendencies that we will have to deal also in the probably in the Indo-European in history playlist because let's say the intertwinement of the older pagan um, power ideal and one of uh, Christianity but specifically the one of, of Roman Catholicism and properly Western European Christianity had definitely brought to a, a lot of syncrasis and uh, in a warlike nature almost of the same uh, Roman Catholicism that you know does recover a lot of the violent militaristic uh, ideology of the pagan past much more than we think and was in fact part of the reason in my opinion why it was so successful in a way but again this is one of the topics that, uh, as I was saying, I would like to discuss today, but it's not quite uh, on the list for this video. And um, a late medieval papacy that had in fact un undergone uh, the acknowledgement of the crisis, broadly speaking, but still was standing on its feet and within itself stronger than ever, arguably. Um, as you know, the, the schism that, that had uh, hit uh, Western Christianity from the, the end of the 14th, the beginning of the 15th century, had um, definitely involved and uh, generally, um, you know, perturbed Christendom in its deepest convictions. And this was the the main blow that was suffered by probably universality altogether both the papal and the imperial one um, in ways that again were different but that struck even when the, the two were fighting against each other each other at the end of the day yet um, by the 15th century the papacy as a monarchy reacquired after the schism its own absoluteness you know that we never that's not a weird thing at medieval history based channel we never talk about the Council of Constance All right. uh, or the in fact the, uh, the schism in itself the election of three popes at the same time anti-pope um, and uh, and yet that's that's um, a quite you know interesting picture of how critical uh, the the confusion had become probably within the ecclesiastical hierarchy right because Papal power was based at that point on a European base. So we're talking about pre-industrial systems with re 
you say, re reducted coercive power, the Roman Church itself didn't literally have, I don't know, soldiers to send everywhere uh, they, they would. This, they could do this essentially just in Italy. They could provide with money and troops, of course, in other contexts. But say, of course, everything was decentralized by a certain degree. The, the various churches had an autonomy on their own, surely were, um, let's say, operating in mostly for the benefit of, of themselves in relation both to the local monarchies, but also towards the papacy itself. So a lot of interesting uh, things that intertwine also with the process of state building it was occurring at this point and where the greater problems in fact occurred even just institutionally it had already occurred by this time actually think about the Gallicanism we'll see it now uh, and again that's kind of the reasons why we should digress on with other videos on in detail on this topics um, in any case it's important for the papacy to have maintained fundamentally the control in the situation to have reaffirmed its own again, absoluteness, properly as a monarchy, that within the organism at that point was objectively not known in, other, in any other country in Europe, right? Perhaps just in the Byzantine Empire, the imperial one, but let's say, uh, here we're talking about this point as a papal power, something much larger, right? And in fact, this is all the more striking if you consider, as we were saying before, that much of this power was won spiritually morally, charismatically, the primacy of Rome was uh, was out there at this point uncontested and the medieval times had fundamentally um, seen the Roman church struggling in that sense to, to build something that in, in, in didn't exist before as such and that was instead recognized. So in front of the forces that aimed at Re resizing, reducing the papal power, the structural monarchy of Catholic universalism prevailed because it was by that point um, already, already too rooted in the mentality of the Western populations and strongly backed by the large bureaucratic apparatus and the uh, curial and cardinal connections with the courts of the national and territorial states that as we've seen were also the ones which the you know the the, the attrition in in, a, in, a, in certain circumstances had occurred and this was a shared uh, interest after all because uh, in a world where again the the, the statal power is is unfirm in general and uh, the properly the modern state building is uh, has yet begun in a way and, and the same Roman Church had pioneered it right together with France easily where you can basically explain both the papal and French statal development starting from the 13th. Um, even before the, the 14th century with m basically the, the most advanced bureaucracy that had ever been seen in the West um, at that point without considering in fact the two powers uh, intertwined and so uh, other states needed the support of the church because this showed of course that it was not just enough the local church for it but some universal recognized power and still at the time the uh, yes but it was a process of modernization and secularization but we're still talking about quite archaic times where people literally believed uh, deeply in the order of, of things and of universal powers and you know the, the 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 primacy of the roman church the sanctity of properly of the city and also some kind of supernatural broader supernatural hour that had always had uh, historically it was a matter of identity right it's you know Christianity has been described um, by you know high medieval standards uh, as a sort of you know national identity that even surpassed in a sense the various actual national ones that were taking form rough right and definitely in just in a national sense but not in nationalistic sense which is collectivistic and has nothing to do with universal tradition in fact, 
Um, so by the mid 15th century, the season of Renaissance papacy began. Right, this was a, a complete turn in the history um, of Europe, right? Not just of Rome. This is not just about the Renaissance in itself. It's properly um, the, the the papal states uh, acquiring a much firmer ground, properly as an international polity. Uh, the uh, the dramatic increase in importance of uh, of the same Rome. And that benefited enormously, of course, from the coming back of the papal courier from Avignon, that had been, you know, part at least, you know, the of the tool through which the the great uh, Western schism had occurred. Because, as you know, fundamentally, it was about the election of Martin V and the uh, anti-papacy that still, you know, wanted uh, to rule from Avignon and the other the side the faction that wanted to rule from Rome again. And we will see also why this opposition had been born, and in a sense, why the the schism was recomposed in the end, because it was still, you know, it didn't have to do with the the real possibility of the split of the church, right? The 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 the, uh, the highest risk in medieval times was by the 12th century with the Cathars in Occitania, but that was a completely different thing. Here it wasn't much of an heresy in general, in spite of you know still the reemergence, as you know, late medieval times of important movements. Think about the youth sites, but also in England there were some, as you know, some instances on that ground. Um, but it was just um, let's say a conflict in many ways internal to the same ecclesiastical institution, and so an institution that would not disavow itself, considering what was at stake had it been united. So the theocratic concept of the Church of Rome remained in canon culture as it had been developed uh, for a long time uh, throughout mostly the, the high middle ages to, to build properly the papal monarchy as, as, as we know it, uh, even if very reduced were by late medieval times uh, its connection with reality. Right, uh, so what would also be resumed by the Protestant uh, ideology uh, and propaganda, the, the idea that the church, of course, was something uh, too uh, uh, earthly in nature and too limited in power by that point to represent actually a, a, a real theocracy and especially all, all over Western Christendom. But it still, again, as we were saying before, the general mindset recognized the Church of Rome uh, as such, also because the same canon law that had been developed fundamentally was enforced everywhere in the West, and so it, it had also been developed in parallel to the uh, to to the civil law, and uh, this had, um, generally speaking, showed how the both the secular and ecclesiastical culture had developed in parallel and had also benefited from each other exactly because in many ways it was in, also in contrast um, they, they were in contrast with each other and a conflict is one of the best most greatest powers in, of hybridation that we can have so the long low medieval story of the power and of society had surely resized the uh, hierarchic conceptions of Gregorian origin that in the 12th and the 13th century had largely penetrated the ecclesiastical body all over Western Christendom even if with different interpretations and again it was the same church interest everywhere uh, to stress such prerogatives once that they had been formulated and somewhat adopted formally, juridically, um, and these same um, uh, bureaucratic nature of the papacy um, were not, however, just uh, the fruit of uh, an internal uh, orientation of the ecclesiastical institution. Uh, the, uh, everything was criticized in terms of power and prestige and, and wealth of the church, and uh, her universal claims of 
superiority over the same imperium, at least as a medium, with the divinity, were also an answer, a reaction to the competition that the Roman Church had had in the previous centuries. Um, so external factors that had solicited the exaltation of the universality of papal power as instrument of clerical hegemony. So, as we've seen many times between the, the, the 12th and the 13th century, the religious competition um, of the heretical churches that existed as such, not as simple movements that were crushed, you know, in the free independent thought. No, they were viciously repressive and um, violent organizations that, that were structuring themselves in sometimes with much more aggressive means of the same Roman church uh, properly to create a sort of secession from the same and there is a reason if by that point they were put down which is not just the church you know as a uh, a temporal and a spatial reality what could again the the popes from from Rome and mostly the, the surroundings could do with you know there was a massive um, radical movement in Occitania or or in the Rhineland or whatever uh, this you know the fact that the Roman Church had won also and obviously thanks to the support received by the secular institutions that so of course in 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 the existence of a spiritual power of universal scale a great uh, supporter of their own power in turn um, reveals the the functionality of the Roman Church for for Christendom in the, in also secularly meant in the same 12th and 13th century also the political competition of the Empire and of the Swabians in, in particular this is not to be taken lightly because as we've seen during the uh, repression of the major radical movements first of all the church had really to change uh, face in some ways uh, first of all it had already emerged victorious with a great struggle uh, sanctioned eventually by the conquered that of Worms that had essentially recognized from the imperial side the existence of a papal monarchy per se recognizing the investiture prerogatives in Italy right that the emperor could not fundamentally interfere on and ever less of course in the papacy that had now to define itself as properly as a state right just yesterday we were making that video explaining how that factually happened in terms of territorial power from Rome and the central Italian interland um, and also however to structure accordingly as we've seen from an intellectual from an administrative from, from a bureaucratic even from a military point of view something that again that was carried out relentlessly and successfully by the popes one after the other again in a Europe that as you know at that time was in in full boom and that was essentially showing the, the limits of that the political fragmentation that had you know that that in part had entailed meaning that of course yes this these are the centuries of the structuring of the major European monarchies but at the same time within these monarchies there are other powers other communities other forces that need to be disciplined and brought again under some authority mostly would happen in a consensual way in parallel to of course the the threat of the use of force but that could be used at that point by the same communities and in, in practice this is what happened um, if you considered the uh, the papal monarch with the other you know these heretical currents uh, in a sense right because there were and very often these things overlapped because again the Occitanian uh, centrifugal force the, was not just uh, an anti-Roman thing it was actually an anti-French thing and it kind of intertwined with other interests of other polities think about the crown of Aragon etc so it was a very complicated thing and the church again won this massive struggle but the main 
threat was definitely, uh, in a way, the, the, uh, the Empire, the Hohenstauf and the renewed um, Holy Roman rule that aimed at securing the imperial control over Italy and over the papal uh, election, as it had happened during Ottonian times, even though those were kind of a bit different times considering the actors involved, uh, you know, aside from the Empire and the Papas as well. Uh, and that was born really by the Papacy also with an enormous amount of expense that showed already at that point the the power of the church in, in the form of properly of the support that it had received. Naturally, now we're not talking about the the enormous step towards that had been done since the eighth century, but since the beginning of the same church, uh, you know, starting from the, the evangelization of Europe, but passing through the uh, that's the same uh, process, but through, for example, the universalization of the same power that took a real, uh, even intellectual vest during the the tenth, uh, the the eleventh century, ideologically speaking. Um, so we're talking really about bonds that the church already had massively with the rest of Europe. And at this point, uh, she used to fuel, for example, the resistance of the Lombard League, literally the sub sub support of half of the Italian communes uh, from a financial point of view to fight against the emperors and win by the way, and, and recognizing in that sense, together with the Lombard League victory at the Council of Constance, uh, not the one of the schism, but the one of 1183, um, the prerogatives, both of the communes, and in that sense, in direct the same papacy that was remaining autonomous and prospering in, in, the, same, in the same phase. That was a big deal, because by the, the 12th, 13th century, the, the Swabians were the largest power in Europe. Right, so they're not uh, really you know, just the last of these, and uh, there was a lot, of course, that the papacy was doing uh, in in other spheres. Here we're not talking about the Crusade, for for example, but that was another massive chapter we do not address as much as the connection with the Byzantine Empire that up to the the first half of the of the 12th century was even seen still as an option by Rome as a as an alternative to the West with which uh, the latter which indeed the uh, the papacy had a by that point a much stronger bond uh, and in a sense perspectively it kind of was oriented to from a very early time actually much earlier than, than we normally think since Merovingian times um, but indeed, the papal monarchy as we know it is something that starts from the second half of the 11th century and takes forms in the 12th properly from any formal, even steadily institutional point of view. So those were the massive challenges. Then eventually the inclusion of the pauperistic evangelic movements that had reinforced the Roman ecumenism because these were the same fringe heterodoxes that were fundamentally fueling the ranks in typology of the same heretical churches and that were won over by the church with a also thanks to this new hierarchy was built solidly theologically doctrinally in the 13th century is also the century of scholastics the important shift from platonic mysticism to aristotelian rationalism in uh, in in the western church was the new how to to adapt also to what were the new lay trends because that you know Aristotle was banned as you know as you know its texts were considered a radical um, in say University of Paris so the the theological uh, you know University of Europe par excellence uh, and that yet instead the the church managed with extraordinary effort and individuals like uh, Bonaventura or Thomas Aquinas to to integrate this massive uh, scientific, a rational tradition of Hellenic origin, as you know, mediated through um, the Arab philosophy, 
uh, that uh, you know changed the in fact the tone of probably of Western Christendom uh, culturally for forever because the Aristotelian Ptolemaism remained uh, fundamentally up to you know you have very recent times as the official position of the church and again fact that Platonism was abandoned and this kind of more uh, emotionalistic religious tension uh, was also more in common with the, the earlier church is, is, a, is an enormous deal and a, capa a capacity of adaptation that allowed the church to properly even provide with the in fact the, the, the intellectual authority the educational authority that allowed in fact the populistic evangelical movements also to be accepted regulated controlled educated and turned into the, the, the highest educators in Europe because Franciscans and Dominicans fundamentally turned into that theologically in, in universities, etc. They began to teach everything. And as you know, especially the, the Franciscans were quite fringe um, you know, in terms of heterodox, etc. So that was an enormous success that had consolidated at the peak of universalism the, what was really the men's Papal power, especially between the 13th and the 14th century, right. starting with Innocent the Third to Boniface the Eighth. That's really the golden age, and in fact, between the 13th and 14th century, the Church would take over also large part of what had been the imperial uh, power in the broader European balance. Um, a power that was actually filled, however, from a secular point of view, more than else, by the Kingdom of France. That, as you know, during the 13th century, while basically the German monarchy was collapsing, imploding, literally, uh, the, the French state was, had become by far the largest power in Europe and uh, essentially overflowing even outside of France. As you know, just think about Naples and the connection there with the papacy because that had been carried out through a crusade against the same heirs of the of the Hohenstaufen, the same Balkans, the crusades in Egypt, etc. So an enormous French power that in the temper of the times and so this triumphant universalism and ecumenic ambition had substituted in a way to the, the same literally imperial power. So we've seen, I think we made a couple of videos about the clash between Philip IV and Boniface VIII and how both essentially claimed um, uh, an imperial power in scale. I mean, think about Gallicanism, Caesar of Papism, the ambitions of the French uh, of the French kings, not just on a secular level, but li literally as heads of, you know, at least of rulers of their own church. Uh, locally in their own ki their own kingdom a pope like Boniface the VIII that could claim to be Caesar to be the empire himself so something enormous that again that's that's why we should talk more about this in theoretical terms because the ideology behind this phrase is not just some kind of odd um, you know uh, propagandistic ideology it's it's actually a pretty substantial one because at that point who did own the empire the real empire, the imperium, divinely meant, and uh, in a world that had recognized just brute force as the actual display of the same empire historically, and you know, considering that the papal French axis was ruling Europe at that time largely, uh, well, some claim of that kind would exist. And what is fascinating about that is that paradoxically, while uh, Philip IV was sending his uh, own um, uh, ministers uh, in Italy to join with the local um, anti-papal uh, uh, Ghibelin Roman <laughs> aristocracy to slap and rob Boniface VIII in Anagni, famously enough. Um, papacy and France were still allied, and they would remain so, historically, with the wealth axis. So that tells you how as we were saying before, first of all, how necessary secular and spiritual power needed each other, and how the unity between the two powers were, was 
properly necessary for any kind of possible claim. So much they would try to strip each other of the respective universal functions, which is exactly what had going on been going on with the Germanic emperors, right? And uh, and this also shift of the axis, let's say, from papacy from 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 the Germanic emperors in general, at least to the fact that. Um, the renewed French power had been able to substitute itself to, to the German one is also a big deal for you know the crisis of universalism because um, generally speaking the Holy Roman Empire had consolidated even there quite informally if you want the idea that they were really the center of power and um, that the, 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 the detainers of the Imperium there was not really you know uh, even there formally stripped um you know from from germany itself on the contrary kind of nationalized further but that still mm, factually showed how the center of power was shifting easily uh, from institutions that had those universal claims as well so as we've seen the big crack had actually occurred by the mid 14th century so that when we look at late medieval europe also the, the great schism etc we're looking at definitely a different Europe that was such for so many reasons that the the, the, the relation between papacy and empire can just reflect partially and given that their power had shrank most at that point right um, but indeed even in those times of crisis and in a sense even especially those ones um, the same rebellion of, of the French war that claimed, you know, the the, su the superiority of the Roman uh, of the French king uh, over the papacy as far as the local uh, French church was concerned, and immediately afterwards the uh, tail strike of the Germanic and rather of the Ghibelline world to the theocratic claims of the papacy were. Yet another reason why the, the church would evidently, you know, entrench itself further ideologically in its own pr premise. Um, and this is kind of really understandable, right? We have made in autumn multiple videos about the decline of universalism. We talked about, uh, we talked a lot about Dante. We talked about William of Ockham. We talked about Ludwig the Bavarian and uh, Mar Marcellus from Padua. So all thinkers that, in a way, in that crucial time of the early 14th century, properly described also from a political, uh, religious, scientific, and juridical point of view, the fracture that had occurred, the uh, immense sense of decline, that both papacy and empire had undergone and uh, with a radicalization by the way of their own ideologies because going as far as saying that any kind of uh, church temporal power was just you know uh, a fruit of you know some demonic reality and that basically any papal government could, could not exist if not on, on properly the church itself was a claim that had never been uh, made and that frankly not even, you know, in the previous generation before Marcellus of Padua had not, mm, could, couldn't fight any, sp any space, right? Everybody had thought up to that point that papacy and empire was necessary to, to, to back each other and to sustain the Christendom, to defend it. Um, and it, it was real because, again, what had happened between the 11th and the 13th century, in spite of all the conflict between papacy and empire, after all, was also one of the single most civilizationally impacting uh, eras in the history, not just of, of Europe, but of mankind, that can be, you know, can be assessed, uh, given the enormous, enormous political, juridical, scientific, administrative, uh, properly statal development that that the same conflict between papacy and empire had produced, and it's um, we we t we talked often about that too, and 
investiture controversy, and it's mostly it's a juridical fallout. Say that, but that alone, the recovery of, of Roman law, etc., was, as you know, it would radically change the entire European uh, juridical science, in medieval times. And the uh, so th this is the scale, of course, of 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 the of the changes of the interests of the ambitions that these powers had. So it's very important to to assess them. And the the mid 14th century it's in this phase of instability, of regression, and so at the beginning of the 15th when we we see the popes coming back to Rome and making all that uh, a great capital once again eventually Rome would become the center of the Renaissance it's most of the astonishing uh, beauty that you can observe in the city today but just by sheer if it wasn't just by quality but the sheer quantity right the the properly the, the immensity of papal wealth and power uh, that was able to produce that to give people work um, and all the international reconnection of the city with the rest of it. I mean, it, it's one of the single most important topics that you can touch in general. This uh, Rome had n never really lost it, right? The entire universal debate had passed even through such a uh, you know infamous figure like uh, Cola di Rienzo and uh, the uh, the Avignonese papacy, the the Luxembourg emperors, uh, the great capitals of Europe at the time, uh, and figures like Petrarch, like uh, Charles the Fourth, uh, Prague, uh, etc. So we were talking about really a centrality that was never lost, and that actually most uh, even secular powers complained about in terms of you know Rome must come back to be the center of Christendom, and much of the Avignonese parenthesis kind of fueled that sense of you know of disorientation that had shifted even. The Curia to France, right? Not just you know the empire from Germany to France, but the, literally the papal courier from Italy to France. Um, the national elements started to have a way in in the process, uh, as well. Think about the invectives, of, you know, Catherine of Siena, etc. But uh, other great figures thought the same. This was also the great revival of the classics of humanism. It was an ever more um, an ever greater attention toward, even toward the form of power, the definition of the same, in, uh, in, in something that went beyond. We want that reduced uh, the, the scale of universalism as well, but that still provided it with the face that we know eventually in modern times and properly the, the political modern of, of the Renaissance. Um, what the Roman Catholicism maintained quite firm in all in all these uh, vicissitudes was the um, vertisistic structure as a papal monarchy properly meant a structure that was destined to perdure and actually to strengthen in the following centuries within the same. Roman Church to arrive basically to our to our days because uh, the Vatican City is basically the only absolute monarchy still in existence, rather than being a theocratic state just per se. But it, it properly has a uh, a political institutional balance that is unknown to any other polity in the world and. This, independently from the possession of temporal power and even of uh, uh, hierocratic will, right? Still, it maintains that face, and it's an enormous relic of the past that, again, is also too often overlooked. And of course, the church has changed. You c you can agree that, um, aside, of course, what Protestantism brought uh, and everything, but that also. Christianity has been uh, Catholicism has been tended to it's not really even one anymore like churches in the world have fragmented to the point that that so many schisms have factually already happened even if, if in today's language are not really uh, addressed as such but much of what we see of the same uh, the same, the same differences that you can spot even between the various popes etc that there are different backgrounds that 
the Catholic Church has difficulty to reconcile with this enormous legacy that is definitely also cumbersome in a way, but still should embody that same universal centrality that the, the uh, Rome always claimed to have in the first place. Um, so of the many things that were lost, uh, a, a safe legacy is definitely the one left from the reform of the 11th century. So the papal monarchy as a uh, e ecclesiological and ecclesiastical conception and articulation. That is to say, properly the idea of Rome as the center of the world and as a center of the church, which again is literally a medieval reality as we know and that was actually inheriting um, a universal past that went far beyond and went far beyond even Christendom itself uh, by, by a certain degree and yet again this is one of the things we should reflect on uh, both in the history of the church itself that we're making and we know definitely that the you know, the Christian church at the time of Constantine was not exactly the same thing at, at the time of, uh, I don't know, even at the time of Justinian, and you can imagine by the time of the Gregorian reform, or the time of Charlemagne, before even uh, in, in the between. Um, and so what Rome actually achieved was extraordinary, exactly in, in, in the monarchic idea, which is quite uh, imperialistic in mindset, if you think about that. It still reflects, as we were saying before, that important pagan legacy of, of military glory that was at the base of all the traditional peoples, uh, the religious military principle that, uh, I, that, that the Roman Church did maintain historically in all the values and symbols um, that it had to actually collect much of the legacy of what the, properly the, the Roman Imperium really was. And so even what happened in the Middle Ages in terms of the role of the church as in the West, because in the East this wouldn't happen as a medium, by the way, between God and, and, uh, and ru um, earthly rulers, in terms of as far as the Imperium was concerned, to the point that popes would say, if you don't have my permission, you can't even become an emperor. Well, that's something that even properly for, through the imperial conception itself tells you how the popes really believed that their duty was was connected to that to that faculty and to that power, and so they they would retain uh, spiritually uh, this you know this role of saying yeah you 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 know everybody can rule in this earth. But, uh, because God wants, but you know what kind of standards do you have in in the in the process, and what you know how much can civilization benefit from a regulation that doesn't let, like it had happened in the East, um, the system sclerotizing. You see, the the Byzantine emperors had maintained, for example, the the title of Basileus Autocrator, which was um, actually. Um, Caesar papistic title of some sort because it still reflected the ancient idea that you could really be a god if you wanted. This was the actual belief at the time. And see how that world mm, crystallized on itself and eventually who took over the actual empire in in the world, right? And even in the same Constantinople with the Fourth Crusade, eventually even with the with the Turks. And Look at what the West achieved by having an authority that said, look, watch out that you're not really even a god. And this is in interesting enough because the same Romans originally had the guy on the chariot of the victorious imperator bringing literally the spoils of war to the temple of, of, of Jupiter Op Optimus Maximus, kind of embodying the same um, whispering, remember that you're just a mortal, right? So the legacy that the Roman Church obtained, very far from being kind of a, you know, an alien that infiltrated the, the other, you know, the, the free kind of uh, heroic ethos 
uh, of the pagan world, etc., was one of the greatest civilizational functions, in my opinion, that achieved the West to, to, to obtain results that no other, no other reality fundamentally uh, reached historically. Um, even though, of course, this is inscripted in a broader frame of uh, aging of the world that surely it can be seen a, a, as a decline, because, of course, the West nor any other power since Roman times uh, obtain the same degree of power uh, historically, globally, right? Properly by this, the the sheer size of power, right? In 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 power is moral, right? So this has nothing to do with the territorial extension, uh, you know, uh, of 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 power cartographically speaking. This has to do with the nature of power itself. Uh, the golden age has not been repristinated, right? Augustus had achieved that. That was the entire deal of, of the of the universal religious military tradition of of the world of the Indo-Europeans, etc. Ever since the world kept aging, and some have wanted to see in this, you know, the, the role of the church as you know, kind of a degrading role because it would have um, apostatized, in a sense, the the divine and the human dimension as a sort of you know. Uh, you know, not not connected realities where you just need the church medium to to achieve the the transition um, with with God's will. So that's a very complicated topic. But at the same time, if you look at at, at uh, especially Western Christianity, you realize that um, most of the beliefs again of the pagan past were there mechanically speaking. But how properly the imperium, the glory, the immortality w was achieved. So indeed, Christianity had a, a different origin and a different vision of such things, but the New Testament in itself has, and the Old Testament as well, actually, with the God Lords of Battles and the same thing, are even in their in their ensemble, which was criticized in the early times of Christianity. Instead, the the Orthodox in the Romanity always said, "No, that can that, that doesn't go without it." And all the Gnostic heresies and thinking about that. Actually, I think it's a very good description of the existential reality. And the fact that every, it doesn't matter how powerful you are in this world, you still have to acknowledge that, yes, we would all like to believe that if you make no mistake or error, etc., you can literally transfigure. Uh, but you have to be literally Jesus Christ to do that. That's what Christianity says that. And who are you to claim, even as an emperor, that you are perfect in that regard? And you can achieve that even as Because it doesn't seem to, to have really occurred historically anywhere. So um, there is, of course, a time of years and time of men. The world ages, and so things are going down anyway. And don't think that this is not a descriptive reality. But... Again, these are other considerations that maybe we'll deal with in another in another video more, hopefully. Uh, for now, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. See you next time. Bye.